Ian Reid is a critically acclaimed, award-winning author currently based in Kingston, Ontario. Aside from writing two non-fiction memoirs and contributing to outlets like The New Yorker, Reid has had two stunning, suspenseful novels published, 2016's I'm Thinking of Ending Things, which is being adapted for a future Netflix production by Oscar winner Charlie Kaufman, and most recently, Foe, both of which were published by Simon & Schuster in 2018. Foe is available now and ahead of appearances at events like the 2018 Eden Mills Writers' Festival, Ian and I had a talk about coupling and confinement, farm life and isolation, writing practices, suspense and science fiction, the Toronto rock band Mets, and much, much more. With in-kind support from Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, and of course, listeners like you who make flexible monthly pledges at patreon.com slash creative control, download episodes, and ask your friends to subscribe to this podcast just like you do. This is the 416th episode of Creative Control featuring Ian Reed with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hi, Ian. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm pretty well. I'm pretty well. It's uh, nice to speak with you. Where in the world are you today? I am talking to you from uh, Kingston. I'm sitting at my desk uh, and uh, just finishing up my coffee, and so it's a comfortable place to be. <laughs> uh, now, how long have you been in Kingston? Well, I, you know, I studied here when I was uh, in my undergrad, and um, I left then for a while after I finished. I uh, uh, was in Toronto for a number of years and ended up back in, in Ottawa and, uh, I was, yeah, I'd spent some, some years in Toronto, which I enjoyed, but uh, I, I think because I, I grew up on a farm, I think I was inclined maybe to find, uh, living in the city slightly overwhelming, um, just with the people and, and, um, hard to be, hard to be alone basically. So I found my way back to Kingston a few years ago. Um, I think I've been here for five years now and, when I, when I first arrived, I, I was anticipating, you know, I might be here for a summer or, or, you know, half a year, um, and then and then maybe back to Toronto. But I've, I've stayed, and I and I really like it here. I'm I'm, I'm productive. I, I found I work well for the most part, and it's nice that it's close to uh, Toronto, so I can get there if I need to. Close to Ottawa, close to my farm, my family farm, so I can I still go up there a lot. And and um, I do I, I do like it. Do, have you been to Kingston much? Do you, do you know the city? I've been to Kingston a few times. The last time I was there was for the last uh, Tragically Hip show, I guess. That was, oh, you were here for that, right? Yeah, I went to the show, and uh, it was. Um, and I drove. It, I, dro- I drove straight home right after it. I wrote. It was. I, a, I wrote. I wrote it up for my uh, for an assignment I was on, and like, right. and then I just at a Tim Hortons near the highway. I think like before you get on the highway, and then I yeah. like, like in the parking lot, and I, I just yeah. thought I should. Uh, Get because uh, it's a four-hour drive from Kingston right. to Guelph. So I, yeah, that's the last time I was actually in Kingston. So a it was, of- um, it was a pretty impressive evening. I thought. I mean, just you know, I was, uh, I was not in the in the show, but I was outside uh, Market Square where they had set up a TV and where people had gathered. And I, you know, I don't think I, I don't think I've ever been sort of part of such a big crowd of all ages. You know, children, mm-hmm. uh, seniors, um, and there was, there was no. Um, no fighting, no no public drunkenness. It was very positive. It, you know, it was. Um, I really found that encouraging, and it was a it was a memorable night. I think for Kingston for that reason. Does that band still the tragically hip? Do they loom large in Kingston? They do. Yeah. They do actually. Yeah. yeah, and I think you know people feel there's a there is a bit of a, a pride I think in Kingston with with the band and and uh, you know how they know how the rest of the country. Uh, feels uh, uh, about them and and um so they they do i think and you see that you see some of the band members around town periodically and they're part of the community and um i mean often i think if you're out you know having a beer or something on a patio you'll hear a song you'll hear a song and um it, it, it does seem to be sort of ingrained in the in the, the culture of kingston which i think most people are uh appreciate and are you know are happy with now are you a, a fan of theirs did you ever see them I, I am. Yes, I did see. I, I saw them. You know, when I was young, they were uh, probably one of the first concerts I, I, I saw. I mean, I think I think the very first concert I saw. Not that this is relevant, but I think it was, I think 
it's just coming to me. I think this. I think I went to ACDC with my mom. Wow. What, yeah, when I was like, uh, you know, twelve or something. Um, Razor's Edge and, tour. I, probably, actually, yeah. And like uh, Thunderstruck, was, Money Talks. Yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. And it was, um, it was at the you know I think then called the Palladium where the Senators play. Oh, it's in Ottawa. It, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was in Ottawa. It was in Ottawa, and and, and Slash's uh, Snake Pit opened. Um, right. I remember that, and uh, it was a fun night. It was pretty, you know, wild crowd, and they they sounded great. And and I mean, it's, it's for me, it's still like if if you if you put on like the ACDC live album or something, um, people are going to enjoy that, right? It's uh, it's pretty fun music. So yeah, three years ago, I took my then four year old son to see ACDC because he was uh, oh he was obsessed, and I well <laughs> yeah. because of me, I guess we would just play them in the car, and yeah, he really liked them. And he's still, it's also great driving music, right? You, I mean, that's like road trip, and you you put that put that record on, and it's going to be fun for a little while. Yeah, all that stuff has kind of left him a little bit as he's moved on to other music and stuff. But apparently, my wife says just the other day, he very curiously was like, "What's that song, Mistress for Christmas, about?" <laughs> and my wife is like, "Oh no, why is this coming <laughs> yeah. back?" Because he always. Yeah. I'd be like, I think I want to skip this song. And he'd be like, why? Yeah. Of course, that's like, okay, can you, every time yeah, we exactly. got in the car after that, can you play Mistress for Christmas? I'm like, no. Oh. The, the fact that you want to skip it, it puts a big problem, yeah. puts a big highlight on it. And yeah, he'll, d- he'll return to those songs. So I'm sure he'll return to them at, at different stages of his life. You know? Oh, he still likes them for sure. But uh, yeah. we just don't listen to them as much. That's all it is really. But yeah. in any case, that's cool. Like you said a few things there uh, that I want to follow up on. Uh, from what I can gather, you, you grew up on a farm in Ottawa. Is that right yeah just outside of ottawa so i think maybe maybe technically it is in the, within the boundaries of the city um and but certainly felt more rural um you could drive into the city in about 40 minutes or something like that but uh, we were very much outside of the city and we had uh animals you know livestock sheep chickens ducks dogs cats um we had bees for a while uh, so it was it was it was fairly busy and un- un- unusual a lot of my friends kind of were were just within starting of suburbia so they didn't have necessarily a farm life uh, so a lot of times my friends when I was growing up were happy to come out and, and visit um, because it was it was so different from what they were used to so we could go on long walks in the fields and mm-hmm. you know carry carry hay to the sheep and, and stuff that for them was was kind of fun and for me was sort of my normal chores um, which which were not the usual kind of chores so well, you also said that, uh, and I'm trying to unpack this because it was a, a few moments ago, but you said something about, were you saying you felt isolated in Toronto and needed to come back to? I, I felt, I did feel like, not not isolated necessarily, although I think I think I, I could probably say that as well, I, I, but I, it, it was, I, I think I, I felt a little more, that it's a little bit more overwhelming for me, just my personality, the amount of people, like I would always find getting around in Toronto I never loved being on the subway when it was busy or a busy street car. Even just walk, like, walking down the street is 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 there's a you know an energy and I and I like it. But I just day to day I found it difficult to get around and and it's loud. A lot of people will kind of find that that comment probably silly. You know, of course it is. But I for for, for some reason I'm aware of that and um, I, it's one of the things I notice when I'm at the farm. It's just how quiet it is and I I, I do feel like I'm more comfortable in that kind of setting. Um, so, uh, you know, I love the city. I love Toronto. There's, you know, it's a, what a wonderful place. And, and, uh, but just to, to live there for, for me is, um, there are aspects of it that I find a little bit more difficult. Well, I bring this all up because, uh, your two novels, which are both remarkable, the two that I've read, and maybe there's more, forgive me Thank if you. I'm wrong. No, there's two novels. That's, that's, <laughs> you have a that's couple, accurate. you have a couple of memoirs, right? Yes, that's exactly. So right. two books of nonfiction and then, and then two novels. So, so the two novels are, I'm thinking of ending things and now, uh, foe is the most recent one as we're speaking That's and correct. they're both uh ostensibly set on farms on some yes. level there's like yes. farm life there and yes. there, there's there's very few characters so correct. the reason i bring this up is because uh i wasn't sure what the connection was until we, we've spoken here and this notion of peopling your stories with you know as few characters as possible kind of speaks to what we were just talking about i think in terms of your relationship to humanity and then and then this notion of the action taking place in relative isolation on these farms on these kind of forgotten tracts of land these days you know i i find that kind of curious and 
I assume now that we've spoken that that that, that you were inspired to write these books based on your upbringing and, and maybe the underbelly of what might go on in such atmospheres. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. I I didn't necessarily um, set out to do that. I mean, uh, my first book, which is an, uh, a memoir, a nonfiction book, true story, uh, is also takes place on the farm because it's about the year I moved home to live on the farm with my parents um, after university. Yeah, uh, and so three quarters of my books all all have that element to it. Um, and and that's not it's not intentional. It's not that that's uh, I sort of sat down to write these books and that okay, this has to be on a farm, but. For those reasons you mentioned, um, I think that's a big part of it. I, I, I'm, I'm interested in that. I mean, with the most recent book, Faux, you know, um, um, confinement is is a big a theme of the book. I think confinement, sort of versus space, uh, confinement of a the various forms of confinement. I think and and, and confine, confinement within a marriage, you know, being one of them. Um, and I like the idea of the sort of, of, of setting that in, a, in, a, in an area that is seemingly uh, open and, and, and vast. Um, well, you mentioned confinement in terms of foe, but confinement is also a theme in your first novel, I think, and, and relationship yeah. stuff. I'm just curious, two things. First of all, I wonder if you think farm life is misunderstood, if you, or if you thought, man, farm life is kind of boring, I'm going to make thrillers. <laughs> I'm going to write a couple of thrillers about what it could be like on a right. farm where it's more adventurous. So I, I, I kind of want to broach those two things because I think the notion of having these interpersonal relationships in these relatively serene, but, I mean, blue collar, like there's just a lot of hard mm-hmm. work and effort and, and probably right. some existentialism that goes on when you work a farm. Like, what the hell am I doing that, here? You know? That's 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 right, and I think that's why it, they lend themselves well as far as a setting to these stories because the novels are are sort of i think metaphysical that's that's more the an area that i find interesting that i that i'm sort of intrigued and and want to write about and and i do think there is a lot of opportunity to be alone on a farm um and both either alone with yourself or alone with another yeah um and so i think in the in the case of i'm thinking of many things I wanted to write about solitude and isolation. That 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 that's what I wanted to write about. And and um, when I start a story, it doesn't matter what it is. I, I think I start in a way that I want to be instinctive. That's how that's how I want to start. I don't want to overthink things. I don't want it to be too intellectual. You know, if I'm not if I was writing an academic paper or something, then I'd obviously it would be different. But for for a novel, for fiction, for me, it's really. I think important to, 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 to be as instinctive as possible at the beginning. I think there's opportunity later to be sort of become obsessed with the particulars and the details. Um, but that's, that's for me much later, uh, a much later draft. So the beginning of the story, I just, I just kind of want to start with an idea and that's why I started with the idea of isolation and solitude, which is something I'm interested in because I believe in it. Just as we talked about before in Toronto, I found I couldn't, I couldn't get enough solitude and, and I need that. I, I'm, and I'm someone who I think more people probably could use it. And yet it to, to it only to a point. And so that was what, why for me there was a tension uh, involved. And that's why I, why I felt like I wanted to write about it. And I'm someone who I think at, at certain points of my life have had too much solitude and have, have um, looked for it in a way that probably isn't good. And that's for me also why the book ended up becoming so personal, which I didn't anticipate when I mm-hmm. wrote when I wrote that book. It was my first novel, so it was the first time I was writing a book that I could make up. And because my first two books had been about myself or people in my family, um, I was sort of looking forward to the chance to just make a story up and, and sort of feel separation from the content of the book. And, and it was sort of the opposite. It actually felt much more personal than either of the first two books, which was surprising. Yeah, well, the the, the books and the, and the, the characters in, in both books, I think, uh, suffer from these interpersonal crises where there is a quest for solitude, but they feel trapped within relationships, which yes. is... And, and within that, I think both books are kind of have this um, hopeful tone in that... Well, I'm, ha- I'm happy to hear that because I hope... I, I, I think that's true. I don't know if everybody gets that, but I, I think for me that... That's that's just true. Well, there's this notion that something is going to change in both books, which I find interesting. Like this relation, these, right. these relationships are 
they seem to appear as one-sided relationships where there's a commitment from one side and then a struggle for freedom on the other uh, if we mm-hmm. want to look at it as a, a yeah. you know two people in a relationship trying to figure this out does this stem from your own experience because you you mentioned that you 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 crave solitude um, have, is this an extension yeah. of you and your view of the nature no, of relationships I don't think it is I, I mean I think not in the sense of like you know um, using my own life as an example or anything. I think actually that's one way that these stories aren't personal. They're not sort of drawn from experience in that way. I think they're personal just more in the sense of the ideas themselves. They're things that I'm, I'm sort of consumed with and and obsessed with in a way and interested in thinking about. Um, and so I, I know that for me, if I'm going to write a book, um, I'm going to be thinking about it for years, you know, two or three years or longer maybe. So it has to be something that I don't, uh, that I'm uncertain about, that that I, I don't want to have an answer. Because hmm. um, then, what's the point? Why do I want to spend time writing it? And I think the same can be said for why I, I think these books have, you know, some opportunity for readers to to interpret them. And and uh, I think that's, for me as a reader, I appreciate that. I like picking up a book that I think I get to kind of complete as a reader. I get to finish it. You feel like you're having a bit of a discussion or a dialogue with the author. Do you, do, you, do you think that there's an instructive aspect in some way? Or, or am I like I, I was reading your when I read your books, I think, I don't know if this person likes human beings. <laughs> and now, yeah, I mean, I think, again, like I, if there is a, if there is an element of that, of, of, of something instructive, that's fine. I, I, I think there are I'm, I'm tr- I think I end up posing a lot of questions maybe in, in these books. There's, a, you know, um, in that in, in sort of a philosophical approach where, you know, you have a question you end up talking about it and that leads to more questions, not necessarily an answer. And so I think that does happen in these books a lot. And, and so, so people might, might feel that they might feel like there's a a pessimism underlying the stories. There probably isn't for me. Again, I think they feel a little more hopeful in a strange way for me, particularly foe is almost uh, uplifting for me actually by the end. And I think that might surprise some people, but um, if once people you know read the book and and uh, talk about it, I, I, I would be. I, I wonder how others will feel about that. I know that's that's really the end is sort of uplifting for me. I think that's the way I would describe it. Um, and so, yeah, I think the the content is is just for me. I like to. There is obviously some you know suspense, um, some elements of suspense, but that again to me seems like it's just baked into what the ideas of these book, what these books are about. Um, that there that there's an inherent suspense in them already, and that's why it's, it seems to uh, lend itself well to these types of stories. I want to get to that suspense uh, aspect in a moment, but at the risk of making some kind of uh, sociological comment here, I'd, I'm curious, because of both of these novels, if you have particular um, opinions about monogamy and whether you feel like these books are making any commentary on on that no I, I wouldn't say that i don't think so i'm i'm again i think i i i don't have a lot of firm sort of beliefs on anything i think I'm, that's <laughs> that's what's i mean that's because it, it seems to me if you once you do that you, you've sort of made your mind up i never like to feel like i've made my mind up certainly on anything because that's i mean that's i think the whole point is you talk to people you discuss things you hear what they have to say it changes your view a little bit um, and that's again for me what a book is. That's what I'm trying to do when I write a book is to sort of get closer to something, but it probably will lead to more uncertainty. Um, so I, I, no, I would never sort of want people to think that I have a particular uh, stance on something uh, that the, that this book is about, or it's really meant to be um, to feel in a way like you're sitting down with a friend and you've you know just poured some coffee and, and now you're going to talk for a few hours about something. Well, and, this this notion of just the, the the perspective on interdependency versus independence, I guess, is where I'm coming yes. from with it, because that's that's a it's yeah. a fascinating thing. I, I think that it is. you know we there's all sorts of crass jokes about girls' nights out, or like a girls' night yeah. out, or a man cave, and all this. Like I need my own space, and there's right. there's kind of this social expectation that we are together. People can get together, but they need to have their own lives. But I don't yeah. know if. I, I've been talking to some people about this. I, they're particularly new parents uh, who their dynamic shifts, uh, obviously, because they've introduced a new person into their lives. 
and right. they kind of lose themselves in that. They lose the, the the sense of self. Like, oh, I used to do this with you, and now we one of us has to do it on their own, so that the other one can stay home with the kid. Um, right. And you know, there's no as I as far as I recall, there's no real. Well, I guess there are children in the first novel in in a sense that. You know the one of the nah, kids. you know what I mean? No, no, there isn't a lot of that. I mean, yeah. and that's for for whatever reason that's it doesn't that particular scenario is 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 less appealing for me. I mean, I I find myself not even enjoying you know films that usually have um, that center around kids. Like I for some reason I tend to lose interest more in that. <laughs> and, and, um, I don't know why. I, you know that's um, uh, maybe that will change. Maybe you know I, you don't I, have I, kids. I assume I, I do not have kids. Yeah, no, no, yeah. and and um, but. For for I guess yeah. So for me, it's more relevant, I guess, in my life to be thinking about you know relationships and marriage and how you know marriage is something that that a lot of people assume they will do. I think that's what I find again partly interesting about it is that it's just this this uh, thing that a lot of people don't think a lot about, but just assume it's something they're going to do. Um, well, I I also bring it up because when you think about both books, and forgive me for conflating both books during our conversation. Um, no, I, I I think that's that's uh, relevant to do and and efficient. So I, I don't I don't okay. mind. <laughs> well, I mean, Foe is the newest book, and it's it's amazing, and I couldn't I, I was just levitating by the end of it, if I might say, no, like in my thank you so much. You know, I just was like, whoa, what the hell? And uh, remind me to go come back to the suspense aspect that I alluded to earlier. But yeah, what I was just what just occurs to me is that in both books you have these two person dynamics that are upended by a third person or third the specter of a third person even yeah so there is <laughs> i don't mean to harp on this uh, per, per se and i know you you kind of shy away from saying you're making any grand pronouncements but this notion of a, a, a two person relationship and how that is impacted by a third party comes to mind because I, I hope you would mm-hmm. agree that that comes up in both of these novels. So there's something there's something going on there. Like there's some kind of external force that can interfere. And, and you know, I alluded to the fact that some people, for some people, it's a child. They bring a child yeah. into their life, and that's their third. That's the the triangle is complete, if you will, and they have to kind of negotiate that. You know, it shifts yeah. their own relationship and the way they interact with one another. You're doing this on some level with both of these books. A third person is is sort of either present or tangibly or not and that confuses things so i'm i'm just curious like you you it does uh, well i think it also increases uh it increases tension and that's i think f- from the, a writer's point of view something that you are uh seeking i think R- regardless of what kind of book you know you're writing i think that's um if you're writing a comedy book, uh, tension is still part of it, right? Sure, so, sure. Yeah, um, that's true. And so when you have, uh, when you are kind of uh, focusing on, and this book, Foe, really is about a, a marriage and a relationship more than anything. That's, I think a lot of people probably will be surprised because uh, they're, they are going to come to this book, I think, assuming maybe, oh, this is a science fiction book or it's a thriller. It's really not those things for me. And I, again, I don't mind if it is for people, but it, for me, it's actually a, a story about, a relationship uh, more than more than anything and and a, a particular kind of of marriage and a marriage that is not disrupted by one particular act like a dramatic act like an affair but something that's sort of spoiling over time i still and, i still i can't let go of the fact that you might either there might be a latent impulse in you if it's not explicit but i i can't help but feel like you think or you're in, in within these books anyway you're exploring the notion that relationships on their own are kind of boring and <laughs> and that maybe they need a little jump well, starter. Think, Something needs to kind of razz them up. I mean, you may be able to read into that better than I can myself. And, and I, I, but I think I, I think from my, my sense of it is that I, I guess it's just when you think about how, how many marriages do, do not last, how many end up in divorce and which is, now i mean i don't i don't know exactly but it's over 50% mm. and then within that number who who don't get divorced which is the minority how many are would like to be divorced or who, who are not living in a way that's that's really compatible or mm. or so right again like that just when you just when i hear that i think that's so interesting what i want to think about that and i want to write about that why, why do so many people do it yeah. if it's something that the majority don't do successfully um so so it just becomes i know that's something okay 
I can think about that and I, for a couple of years, it's going to be something. So th- I think it just I come at it more from a, a deep interest in this uh, area of, of human life that seems to be something so many of us want to do. Yeah, no, no, this comes across to me as well. Like you, I feel like there is this kind of investigation of, okay, this is a cultural and societal norm. Why? Right. Exactly. That see that yeah, you just put it way better than I did. <laughs> that's basically it. That you know why? And then as you start trying to unearth why, it, the story becomes more specific and it can't just be this rambling. You have to make it about one particular uh, you know, relationship and but but it's that's sort of the, that is sort of the broad question. And then it starts to become a little bit more too um you know why did you know why does it happen a certain way does, does it in this case does it is the experience different for Henrietta and for junior the two characters and how do they experience the relationship and what does it mean for one of them versus the other one is it the same or is it different and and then yeah when you add the third character and i think that does uh ch- sort of uh, change things and they've been so used to living where they do alone for a long time that um it changes things drastically. So yeah, yeah, and you have characters that figure out they might want to end relationships. Um, Th- that's right. Yeah, that's right. Because and, of, and you know, once you introduce a, another another uh, character, you now have the ability for that for one of the other ones to to talk in ways and think about things and and that maybe they wouldn't have done before. And so um, it's it's helpful, I think, for that as well. And and um, that's certainly the case in Faux. That that does happen. Um, uh, it, 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 uh, and I think that's again sort of uh, that's probably accurate to to real life. Yeah. Well, I want to. Uh, I've alluded to this a few times now. I want to uh, touch upon the suspense thing. Um, and you know, earlier you were saying some people think this is a science fiction book or a, or a horror book or whatever. I described mm-hmm. it as a as a thriller. There are twists and turns here. There is a suspenseful aspect to your writing uh, in these two books, uh, and in particular in. Foe, and you've employed some very clever uh, writing devices, if I might say. I'm, I'm not sure. Thank you. Uh, to the point, I, I don't know how to describe it other than, yeah, you've just, you type interestingly. Let's just yeah. say that. <laughs> you've done some clever yeah. things there. Um, and I'm just curious about where those impulses maybe come from. What has drawn yeah. you to this realm of suspense? And f- for lack of a better term, and if you don't uh, agree with it, I-, I call it a thriller on some level, but... That's fine, yeah. No, I I, I don't really uh, know. You know, I'm not sure why. Uh, but I, again, I think um, it, it, I, I use myself as a reader um, or as, you know, as a, as a person who watches movies. And, and, I, and I, I just know that I, what I find exciting when I pick up a book um, and when I feel like the book has some tension and some suspense regardless of the genre. Um, and so I think I'm, I'm sort of drawn to that, that type of story. And that's the other thing. I, again, there's not a lot of thought that goes for me that goes into why I want to write something. It's, it really does start with something uh, very uh, small uh, mm. and simple. Mm-hmm. And it sort of builds out from there. And I don't, I, I think I'm unusual um, in that I don't write outlines. I don't, you know, plan out these stories in advance. I, I, I start with really with an idea or, I, you know, and, and then I just start writing. You just and go, some, you just start with, you just take, yeah, the, I just go. And I, and, huh. I, and sometimes it doesn't take, like I've had things where I start and then I, but you feel it when it does, when it's, when there's something there and there's a, a momentum. And then again, it starts to become what starts out sort of very difficult. I mean, it's always hard for me. I, I you know, I find writing very hard. And so it, what starts out, very difficult starts to then become it starts to feel like an obsession then you start i'm thinking about it a lot even when i'm doing other things i'm I'm in my mind i'm returning to to the story and the characters and and what what happens for me is then i i surprise myself as i go um and what i hope is that then a reader is surprised too and i think if you if you write an outline before you've written the story you've kind of locked yourself into that yeah and you know what if there was an opportunity to go somewhere else that was even better and it just seems weird to me to write an outline to a story you don't know. And and for me, it's like I know the story by spending a few years working on it and thinking about it. Hmm. Um, and and that's just sort of the way that I work. I would never tell anybody otherwise. I think for a lot of people who, who write books, they, they much prefer, you know, writing an outline. And, and of course, that's right. That's There's not, you know, and I've, I've you know, been to, I've, I've been to, you know, writing classes and stuff where, I, I don't like to teach students one way or the other what to do. It's more about finding what works for you and 
writing something that feels truthful for you and, and, and the way that works. And I, I mean, I also, did, this is kind of, again, a bit of a tangent, but I got, I really, I really disagree with those. You, you sometimes come across these lists, you know, uh, rules for writing. Hmm. Um, and I used to have friends who would send me these every now and then now they know not to anymore because I just, I find them kind of silly, particularly ones like, you know, write every day. I just find that, <laughs> I just find that it's just like outrageous and, and wrong. I mean, no, don't, don't write every day. Why would you do that? I, I, I don't, you know? Yeah, um, sure. And write kind of when you make the time or when you're able to, or when you, you feel the urge to do it or, but I just, I don't, you know, so a lot there, you know, there is for me no proper way to write a novel or to go about doing it or, and that's why I think these, both of these books are, are probably unusual. They end up being a little bit weird and different. And for me, that's exciting. I kind of hope, um, you know, readers who kind of take, take, the, take a chance to pick them up and, uh, that they that they enjoy that aspect of it that they're they're they're, they're maybe it's a, a slightly different reading experience that they're used to and that it kind of asks a little bit more of them maybe you know and and I but I hope that they it's worth it I hope that at least it gives them something to think about and and maybe again for me it's always really nice when people tell me oh I, you know I reread a book or that seems I mean almost too much to ask right that people not only spend the time to sit quietly for a few hours and read your book but then if they they decide to do it again. I, you know, uh, it's it's nice. I almost feel guilty. I think, wow, that, but that's you know, they're they're short. So that's one thing I I, I will say. I have made them short. So mm. for that for mm. that reason, I I can't tell you how many times I've thought of an idea and then don't do anything about it, and then I'm doing the dishes or something, and exactly. then I, and then I'm like, you know what? I got to go write this down. Uh, yes. The idea is yeah. sort of crystallized, and yeah. then I end up writing the whole thing. And then yeah. it's done, and then the dish of water is cold. And no, oh my, that happens to me all the time. Yeah, exactly. I think there's a weird misconception about, like you're saying, like I think if you're sitting down nine to five to make yourself right every day, you're forcing it. Perhaps but you're forcing it, and yeah, no, exactly. And there might be times where that's appropriate, like if you're working on, you know, edits or something, and you have a deadline in two weeks. And it's like, okay, I just need to put in eight hours a day of working on this so I can send this back to the editor or something. Yeah, but. To just sort of, you know, it it just seems sort of uh, false somehow to to demand that 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 makes you a serious writer. I, I just don't agree with that. I, I think there are other things that that go into it, and and you know, who who why who decides that? You know, why why if, if someone if someone sits down and you know writes a creative, interesting story, and they do it in a way that works for them, how is that not serious, or how is that not you know any more valid than the person who? has dedicated five hours a day, every day from, you know, 5 a.m. to an you know, I, I just, it, it, I, I just never understand the point of, of even trying to do that. It, it, it seems just misguided. Well, to follow up on what you were saying about your process, um, you know, you, you say you're, you just start writing, you don't have a, an outline. So it stands to reason then that you, the story and the characters are developing as you go. But is it fair to say that that doesn't mean what you've done is set in stone? Like if the character in particular develops to a point where you're like, Oh, okay. This is this character. Are do you are you prone to going back to where you and started changing. to sort of adjusting the character's personality? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. And I, yeah. I sometimes I will even go off and I'll write for a long time, and which may take me months or something to do, and end up cutting it. You know, um, and I don't mind that in a way. It's it's it, it can be painful at the time because you think I, I did all that work and now it's not going to be in the book, and yet in some ways it is in the book because I'm aware of it, and and it, you know maybe what happened in that part that's cut. Maybe I had to write that to understand something about the character that does remain in the book. So it's hard to separate these things and think, okay, that was completely um, useless. Um, Often it's not, even though it it doesn't. And again, for me, the last couple rounds as I'm working with, with my, with my editors, like a lot of it is really trying to remove stuff that doesn't need to be there a hundred percent. Like I'm really aware Mm -hmm. of trying to do that. I, I really don't want any excess. I don't want it to be, to be, way down in any way and so that that can be tricky that's always hard when you have parts that again i'm it's not like i'm unhappy with the pros or i it's just if it doesn't really need to be there then i i, I end up removing it and what i'm thinking of anything is there was a lot of biochemistry stuff in there that i i'd gone to a you know a lab and look, tried to do some research and learn a lot about that and some of the stuff i really liked and it was it was sort of in a way was relevant for the story but the last few rounds of edits, I just, uh, you know, we, we took it out and it, it, it didn't necessarily have to be there. And yet me knowing it and, 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 and Jake knowing it, the character I think was, was helpful for the story. Yeah. You get a sense that Jake knows what he's talking about. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. that takes time, I think, to really get to a point where that's 
true or it's accurate. And I mean, I wanted to do the same thing with faux because there is an element of, of space. And when I started the book, it was kind of, that was a, it, it was because my brother works in the, in the, is involved in space. And, and I, I knew I wanted to have a story that um, sort of used him as a resource because again, you, I knew I could then do it accurately. And, and I've been, I've, we've talked about movies, you know, that he kind of starts within five or 10 minutes as so it would never happen like that. You know, movies that take place in space. And, yeah. Just um, so, so for people who don't know, Foe, I, I mentioned that Foe is set in a, on a farm, but it's also uh, involved. This uh, space uh, exploration is part of the story as well. And I have to, add, I, I don't know if uh, you want to spill any beans here, but like, I can't tell when the story is set. Is it a post-apocalyptic future? Is it a normal yeah, future? That's, that's also kind of part of what I, I wanted it to feel. I mean, it, I think it, it, I would say it is set in the near future. Beyond that, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Again, it's more. It's more for readers to kind of make up their own minds. I, I think there are times in the book, though, where it feels like it's set in the 1960s, um, and that I kind of wanted that. I, um, so it's it's it, just again as a reader, you're not you're not sure as you're reading. It sort of it keeps you a little bit, um, you know, off balance a little bit. Well, you um, have this notion. I would say that uh, for better or for worse, I think. For Farming kind of connotes a kind of old timey, old That's fashioned right. practice, That's right. That's and then you've right. got that conflated with yeah. emerging technology and space travel. That's right. Yeah, That's that right. that's really fascinating too. Yeah, because and it's, it's. I mean, I was, you know, you mentioned technology, and like obviously, technology isn't the point of this book. But but what's I'm more again interested is sort of the effect that it has on us. Um, that, that's so so. That's what I say. I think people who are coming to sell this, assuming this is going to be sort of a science fiction book they'll, they'll see like there isn't there isn't a lot of stuff explained about that and it's it's part of the story yeah um but uh it, it became less kind of relevant the more i wrote uh, when i realized what what the book really is about for me um and if you think about again when i mentioned like 1960 when basically when you know mm, yeah, space, space was yeah, still, it yeah. was yeah it was still a big part of the what was going on and, and but if you think about how like a marriage a sort of traditional you know marriage would have would have been in that time and, and how it would have been often probably in a lot of situations, not very pleasant. Yeah. And, and, uh, I mean, that's a huge generalization, but, but, um, and I think you can see how in some ways the books is, is getting at, at, at that and how in some ways things haven't changed as much as we sometimes think it has. And so, yeah, I think it's all of that, um, is, is, is there, um, uh, for, for me, for me anyway. Do you think that the central premise of faux, is plausible again i don't want to give too much uh, up in terms of yeah, the book yeah. but in I, terms I, of just the way I mean, we relate to each other and this notion right. of yeah I, I do i think i you know i think I, I do um that's part of why i think there's not necessarily a lot of detailed explanation of what kind of goes on mm. um because i think again the, when you start to do that it becomes less likely uh, I find if i'm reading a book and it's and it really goes into detail about about things that are at this point theoretical it's it seems much more more you're reminded of that more whereas if you if you just sort of present it in a way and give a little bit less i think readers will will understand and they will complete sort of in their mind what they envision what's happening and oh totally uh, like I, I will say one of the more artful aspects of the book for me is is this notion that like nothing's really identified but i can in an age of emerging 3d printer technology and you know right. some of the devices sound like they could be ipads or something you know like there's just that's this right. there's this that's sense right. that this is very close to where we or this technology that you're describing is emerging uh we don't that's have right. it yet but i i get the sense that it's an offshoot of what we do have yeah, exactly. 3D printing limbs and bones and, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, and virtual, combining that with virtual reality. And you can, you can kind of then see where this is heading. And, and I think it's, it's quite reasonable in 30 or 40 years or 50 years, you know, to, to, to wonder what, what, what it will look like. Um, so, and, so you were saying that you don't necessarily know what your impulse is to write the way you write. And you also alluded to the fact that you're a film guy, that you like film. Yeah. Are there, writers or filmmakers that you could cite uh, or films even or books that you can yeah. cite as a potential influence i know this can get into um strange territory because if you identify such things then you're saddled with them forever potentially. oh yeah well, i mean you know i i mean just off the top of my head i know that like for me uh michelle faber who wrote a book called under the skin and it's sort of relevant because it's both a book and a movie mm -hmm. um and 
I, I just uh, again, I was I was very excited when I read that, and I, and I, I have since read it a few times. I, I reread it often, and what I find what I or what I, I guess found most exciting about it as a reader was it, it was I, I didn't know if I wanted to tell a friend about it. It was very hard for me to tell them what the book was. Like I, I couldn't I, I couldn't really say it was a thriller. I couldn't really say it was a horror book. I couldn't really say it was a science fiction book. Yeah, um, and yet it was kind of all of those things. And it's it's but it's literary. Um, it was just unusual, and I loved it. And I also feel that way about the movie. I think that, I think it's it's um, they're very different, which I also kind of like. I like when a, a book and a movie are different. Um, and I also appreciated the movie. Uh, yeah. And the the, the 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 score and the soundtrack is is really you know adds to it. And I, I mean another one that re- recently um, you were never really here the the Lynn Ramsey uh, mm-hmm. adaptation of, of the of the novella which I saw this year. One of my favorite movies this year, I thought. Oh, okay. Um, I haven't seen it. I, yeah. Uh, I loved it. it um, and, uh, uh, and, well, and most recently one that I, I really, um, that, that sort of, uh, that resonated with me was First Reformed, the Paul Schrader film. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, with, with Ethan Hawke. And it, I mean, it's, it's quite bleak and miserable in a way to, to watch it, but uh you're citing it's very. Way, you're, you're citing relatively recently released films, which I find. Or and and. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's just because it just comes. You know, it comes to mind right now. Um, uh, because yeah, there are things I've I've thought about recently. Okay, um, I just wondered that, if there's like a. F- there are any? Are there any fundamental building blocks? Uh, you know, uh, young. I mean, I mean, I think like a lot of people like you know Hitchcock would be one for me that yeah. you know when I was when I was younger and. Uh, watched watched those movies and they they meant something to me and 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 still do I um, uh, and uh, but you know I, I think again there there isn't I, I don't there isn't sort of one uh, type of, of of book or movie or or even music that that I would say that sort of hang my hat on and say well that's that's what I always you know return to or has kind of influenced I I always find that kind of hard to trace back you know to sort of like reverse engineer something I've done and think oh yeah well that came from this this and and um it's funny too because a lot of this a lot of times i really like something as far as a book or a movie i almost i almost don't want to talk about it and i don't, I don't mean with with you I, I just mean in general like i almost don't want to tell people or yeah, yeah. Ex- because there's sometimes it, as you try and explain it, it you it either loses some significance or um it's almost sometimes nice just to sit with it you know and 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 then sometimes I, ref- I go back to things. I often reread books and sometimes it, it has changed, you know, and I think if you try and explain it to people, you end up um, reinforcing why you like it and you almost convince yourself of it. It's, it's kind of nice to think you really like something and then go back and reread it a year later and you don't like it. And you think, <laughs> well, why, why did I like it so much? And, right. and that's, again, it's, this, it's, it's another layer that, that I enjoy. Whereas if you've already told yourself for sure this is one of my favorite books, you're going to think that even when you go back and reread it. And sometimes it happens the other way. You really like a book, you go back and reread it, you're like, and you like it even more for, for a different right, reason. So right. I, that, that's, that, that happens to me a lot. And I am a big, I don't know, maybe there's no such thing. I was going to say a big, you know, supporter of rereading. I don't, I, that's not really a thing, but I do like to reread books. And I, I, I encourage people to do it more, I think, just because there's a tendency with reading, unlike, say, with music or movies, which we rewatch and re-listen to all the time, we don't do it as much as books, and we should. I, I, I just, I, I think, um, you know, I, I've written, an, I wrote an essay about this because I, I think there's a tendency in, in the literary world to feel like there's so many books, we have such limited time that when you read a book, you know, you put it on your shelf and you read it and you know it, and you don't have to go back to it. And there's so many books you should just pick up a, another one, but it's it, that's. I don't think that's true. I think when you when you read a book, even if you read it immediately after, it will be different the second time. I, I just had this experience. I literally just had this experience because I moved some books oh. around and we, we got a second bookshelf. We're running out of space in our home. And I was st- I just very carefully organized and alphabetized our, our library for the first time in years. And I sat back and I looked at what I'd done. And then I had this horrible thought of like, you know, you're probably never going to read any of these books again. Yeah. Why? Yeah, you have- I know that- That's a weird impulse. It is a weird impulse, and that's why. And, and again, I know, I, I, I know. I think the sense a lot, a lot of people get is almost like a uh, not a a boredom, but it, it's like it feels known when you look at that book you've read, and so they don't have the same impulse to pick it up that they would say it 
a new book that's kind of calling to them from the shelf and they think, oh, I don't know what this is. And, yeah. and, and yet, as soon if you start it, if you start into it, it really will be different and you'll notice things that are different. And just your relationship to that story is going to be very different because you're, you're different at that point. You, you, you know, you've changed as, yeah. as a reader, as yeah. a person. And what, what's happening in your life, I mean, all these things do affect your experience and, and whether or not you're tired or whether or not, you know, something you're, you're stressed or not stressed. And, but also, it can also be for me just like the way I tend to like make, you know, macaroni and cheese probably too often, but because for me it's like comfort food and I know how to do it and I can make it quickly and it's delicious and yeah. I like it. Yeah. And so there are books for me that are like that, that if I'm, you know, traveling or if I'm doing something or if I'm, you know, having to wait for someone, I know I can just like pick this book up and read it and I know it so well and it's comforting for me. Yeah. And so it, it also for me, it's sort of like that as well. Um, yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense to me, of course. Um, uh, and music too, right? I mean, music, that, like think about, a record that is one of your favorites or one, you know, and, and how many times you would have listened to it. I mean, it's over and over and yeah. over and, yeah. and there is, there is a comfort to that, right? There's a, there's a pleasure in that. And, and it's well, there's the same. a, there's a comfort and pleasure in it in, in that it feels a bit more finite. Like, I mean, you, you, yeah. the commitment is sort of shorter. Uh, right. wh- whereas if you've spent all this time reading a book, you know, for most of us, you know, I'm, I, Sometimes, like over the Christmas holidays, I'll get through a novel a day if I'm really yeah. dedicated and can find the time. Yeah. If yes. we're on a vacation or something, but books are like something I read in chunks before bed, and yeah. it can take me a long time uh, these yeah. days to to get through yeah. a yeah. a book. Whereas no, I, a record is forty minutes, and it's that's right done. You know, yeah, yeah. that's that is the reality. I mean, you know, I, I think I, I try not in some ways. Maybe it's like self preservation to like not not think about that because I I, I do realize how. It's it is kind of a, a demanding to ask people to spend this time with your work in a way that yeah, say a musician probably doesn't have to consider because they can either it's just about coming to see them live or yeah, it's about putting something on for thirty forty minutes and yeah. with a book you're saying okay, I need you not only to give me hours but you ideally could you please like turn off music and turn off your phone and like avoid your friends and family for this time and don't do any work and at that point the people are like that's you're asking quite a it's asking a lot. And so you, you really then do feel like, okay, but I hope I, I'm going to try and make this worth it for you, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. And, and that's why, that's why the, then you feel like as, as the author, you feel like, okay, I really have to do my work here. I really have to spend time with this, thinking about it. And because there has to be that trust, I think, between the, the, the reader and the, and the writer, you have to feel like you're not going to, again, they're putting their trust in you. They're spending their time with you in that way. And you're yeah. like, okay, I have to make this worthwhile for them. And it doesn't, again, mean that everybody's going to, react well to it or like it but you have to put your you have to kind of um live up to your side of the bargain and and uh that's i i do try i try and think about that i i i I don't try and think too much about um you know what readers will like what they won't like because then that can become limiting to to what you're doing and you can become you can sort of focus on that so I, i don't try and think about like specific readers or how they'll react to something but i am aware of um of how you know reading is sort of unlike anything else, and and it, it does require more time and attention. Yeah. Well, speaking of specific readers, I want to read a blurb from the back of your your first novel. I'm thinking of ending things. Okay. An ingeniously twisted nightmare road trip through the fragile psyches of two young lovers. My kind of fun. Charlie mm-hmm. Kaufman, Academy Award winning writer and executive producer of Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. An adaptation. Now, my understand. I, re- I bring this up, Ian, because my understanding is that you've kind of struck a working relationship with Charlie Kaufman. Is that the case? Yeah, yeah. He read the book not very long after it came out and uh, got in touch with me through my agent. And it was a thrill for me that he had even read it. Um, it turned out that he Amazon had recommended it to him based on his previous purchases, <laughs> uh, which is kind of so. In that case, the algorithm you know worked in my favor. And but it still seems very like I've thought about this a lot after, obviously, because it, it, um, it was a, sort of a, a very meaningful um, development for for me. And uh, I thought there's so much luck involved because not only did they have to recommend the book to him, and then he had to decide to buy it in that moment, but then he had to like read it. I think a lot of us buy books and they sit on our sh- our our desk forever, potentially, right? Mm-hmm. And so he not only was it lucky that he came across it, but lucky that he took the time to read it. And so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm grateful for that. And, and uh, yeah, so he's you know um, we've developed a working relationship, and I, I he's been very nice to me, very kind, um, and he's he's a very smart person. I, I appreciate you know the opportunity to, to talk with him and and uh, hear his thoughts and. 
um, when you're talking about movies earlier, I mean, I think he would be someone for sure whose whose work and movies I have meant something to me, you know, and, and who, who, whose work I, I enjoyed and, and and you know watched multiple times. And, and there are layers in, in his movies that I that again I find very appealing to think about. And um, so it's that's been a very pleasant surprise for me. Is it too early to discuss what the uh, working relationship might lead to? Well, no, I, no, it's uh, yes. Yeah, so th- so uh, he is uh, going to adapt. The, that novel I'm thinking of many things and um, it took some time to kind of figure out h- how that would happen he he had expressed interest in doing that and I was I was very you know I was delighted by that possibility and and then it kind of uh, came about that Netflix was was uh, very happy to make make it happen and and wanted uh, you know wanted Charlie to do it and so he is uh, writing and, and directing uh, the film version um, wow. of, of, of the book for Netflix and, uh, yeah, I mean, I was, again, I, I had no sort of ambition, uh, with that book. I, I, it's a, it's very, it is literary for me. It's, it's internal. It's, you know, it was very much a novel and I think there are only, you know, a handful of people who, 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 who could probably adapt it. And he, he's right at the top of the list for me. I mean, if, when you kind of play those games with friends or something like, oh, you know, if you could have anybody direct your book as a movie, who would it be? You know, he would have been probably the first person I would have named. So it kind of was surreal when it when it kind of started to happen and so uh, is it in is it in production now it's 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 yeah or you know pre-production or it's it's kind of in the phase where it's still you know he's he's working on it and and uh, i'm it's it's been great i i've, I've been kind of been included in, as, as a producer so i get to kind of i feel like it's an opportunity for me to learn as much as possible and in a, about, a, about a you know an industry that I, I really don't know a lot about but i'm very interested in just as a viewer like anybody else i mean yeah. i used to help out at the cinema here in Kingston, sell tickets, you know, so I'm, I'm just someone who loves movies. So okay. just from that, from that angle, it's been really exciting and interesting and, and fun. And, and, uh, as I say, he's been very generous and, and kind with his time. And so that, that is also, I think no matter what you do, what anybody does, um, it, it, it means so much more. And it's just, a when the people around you are, are thoughtful, um, kind people. And, and, uh, that, that always for me is something I'm, I'm kind of grateful for. Um, and I'm, I feel lucky that way in, in a lot of, you know, in, in the work that I've been doing the last few years, I feel like I have a lot of people, um, who I can say that about who, who I'm, I'm you know, fortunate for and grateful for. Congratulations. I mean, that's, well, a, that's amazing. I can't wait to th- see the film. You. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to it too. I think again, I, it's going to be different than the book and, and I, you know, I'm just, it's, it's, um, I think it's going to be scary. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, one last thing before we go. I noticed in both your books, uh, among your acknowledgments and thank yous, uh, Mets. Mets have appeared on this show a couple of times. Right. Uh, yes, uh, I've listened to that. Yeah. So th- this rock band, Mets, wh- what is your connection to them? Um, they have. Um, so I grew up with Alex Edkins from from the band. Uh, we grew up together and uh, we're, he's one of my oldest friends. Um, and so I, I was, uh, you know, I, I kind of take inspiration from, from them, from the, from Alex and the whole band, uh, just because of the way they've kind of approached their music. And I think they, again, I don't want to speak for them, but I think they probably, you know, when they were first started playing together, were ha- just be ha- they were happy playing together and they didn't necessarily think anybody was going to particularly care or take notice. And mm-hmm. if they played for 30 people in some basement somewhere, that was fine. And it just so happened then that you know Sub Pop took notice, and 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 then more people did, and and uh, they are appreciative of that, I think, and and they haven't sort of uh, wavered from their initial desire to play the music that means something for them and that they want to play, and and uh, I, I I try and do the same, you know, with 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 what I write. I, I want to, I don't want to get caught up in oh, what's what should I write or what will people like or if if, if it feels like there's some meaning and value to me and. That it's something I know I can spend time with, then I, I should do it. And so, um, both in that sense, but also just the music itself, I love it. You know, I think they're they're brilliant musicians, and I, I love what they do. So, their their uh, you know their records have meant something for me. And I've listened, you know, I've listened to them as I've been working on these books. And so they're they're um, they're just yeah, I think creatively and and then personally for me, they're they're a part of my my process and my life, and and their and their friends. So. Um, you know, I'm really happy for, for their success and how people have responded to their music. And um, I always encourage people to seek it out, and particularly if they get a chance to see them live. It's really, not, it's, it's unlike anything else you'll see. It's, there's such an energy, and, a, and it's, 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 it's such sincere music to me. And I think that's why people have responded to it. Yeah, they're one of the greatest bands uh, I've ever seen and ever, I agree. ever heard, and I, I love them very much. Yeah. And uh, yeah. 
is there a, has there ever been an opportunity somehow for some kind of collaborative enterprise? Oh yeah, I mean it's funny because Alex and I have been like uh, talking for you know probably two decades about collaborating, and we have we have collaborated on many things that you know no one knows about, and so uh, you know little writing things, and we've talked about different. Um, so I think at some point uh, we would like to we would like to do something together. You know, uh, we have uh, also I can say Alex and I have a have a very similar sense of humor. So anytime we're together, most of the time we're laughing, uh, which, <laughs> you know, which I which I can which I appreciate. And he's he's a very funny person. You know, a lot absolutely, of people yeah. Who 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 know him? You know, he's obviously a thoughtful, you know, reserved. He's um, but he's really funny, and so um, we we end up laughing a lot, and, and uh, it's great. Whenever I'm with him, you know, I try and ask him for some. You know, he's got such a wealth of knowledge of music and musicians, and he he listens so widely that I I, I always ask him for recommendations and what's something that you know he's been listening to recently, and, and then I feel like I can maybe reciprocate and you know give him a book that I've read that I really liked, and so um, yeah, he's he's a funny yet sincere and serious guy. I think he's a nice. No, he is. That's yeah. one, of, one of the things I really appreciate. He's never, he doesn't do anything to impress anybody. He's never, you know, there are certain people, particularly I think in music who you can tell right away, they're trying to impress you by telling you about some obscure thing or, yeah. and he's sort of the opposite of that. He really, he's, he has no interest in impressing you or, or he just, he loves music that, you know, he's, he's, um, he's always loved music and he's, uh, he's got, he's got a great musical mind. And, and, uh, so f- for his friends, someone like me, it's, it's again, he, he, he's a, he's a resource for that because it becomes so fun to talk about music it's it's not you know you, i don't feel um you know bad or guilty for not knowing something he, he it, um it, it's just uh yeah he's he's wonderful to talk to about that and and uh it, it's it's we we have a lot of fun together uh, whenever i'm in toronto yeah I, I always make a point of, of, of seeing him right on it's a small world isn't it i, I mean it I've, is it is exactly and as i've loved you know what, I've, as i say i've listened to the, the interviews you've done with them and and like i was saying you know with charlie and they're also that the band like they're they're just such uh, nice guys they're they're pleasant to be around they they're thoughtful of others they're uh and that's always uh i think that 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 is more important than i think a lot of times people people realize and and uh, so they they definitely are in that category as well yeah i agree well ian I, I i appreciate this conversation i i have to ask you what's next for you and then beyond that i'm also hoping you can tell people where they can learn more about you on the uh, internet yeah um I'm, I've got some. I've got something new. I've been working on it for a while, and it's still very. Um, so you know, it would be very uninteresting and boring, and and so I don't. I won't say too much about that. Um, Fo um, is also hopefully going to be um, adapted as a as a film, and has the the, the, the film rights have sold to an anonymous content, which is a production company. Oh, um, awesome! And uh, yeah, and they've done some great stuff. So I, I, you know, people can look look up anonymous content. You know, they did uh, True Detective and the, the Revenant. Um, they did that movie Spotlight, and they've done some great stuff. So. Uh, I'm working with them uh, early, very early on in that process, but that's that's been a uh, you know an exciting kind of new project as well. Um, and and then uh, come the fall, uh, I am going to be doing uh, a talk and a reading in Toronto at the end of August at the at the Toronto Reference Library with uh, I think I believe with Heather O'Neill. She's um, we're, we're going to be doing an event together, and nice. then basically through September October, I will kind of be out kind of touring so people can if, if 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 we end up in their city can i would love to love to say hello and love to meet people and and hear what they think of these books uh so yeah again um i'm i'm, I'm always grateful for anybody who who is interested and and and, and for, for you as well you know thanks for for taking the time both to read them and and uh uh, for the interest in, and for the chat, it's 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 still at the big you know the early part of the process for Faux, and so I'm 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 still kind of in the stage where I'm I'm uh, it's nice to talk about. I'm still kind of figuring out exactly what to say and what not to say. So it's, <laughs> I, I you know I appreciate the uh, the thoughtful questions. Oh well, that's that's kind of you to say. So where can people learn more about you or follow you online? Yeah, I mean I I have a, I do have a Twitter account um, which is just uh, my last name Reed underscore Ian I A I N. And then my my publisher's uh, website. Um, the books are published by Simon and Schuster, um, so they can find stuff out about the books there. Um, and, Simon and Schuster .ca here in Canada, yeah, yeah, and .dot com in the states. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and and otherwise, I, I don't have a huge online presence. Um, again, I think that probably is indicative of my my, my personality that is not necessarily uh, attention seeking, I guess, um, right, and a little more reserved. So, but yeah, you know, Twitter uh, that's one way. So. Well, I mean, all I'll say is thank you for your work and, and thank you for this conversation, Ian. I wish you the the best of luck in the future, and I hope we speak again sometime. 
well, thank you again very much. And yeah, it was a, it was a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, I'd love to love to talk again. And, and hopefully, I'll see you sometime on the road or at a, at a show or something. Yeah, I'll be at the Eden Mills Writers Festival, which I believe you'll be attending. Ah, okay, yes, I I look forward to that. I will see you there. Special thanks again to Ian Reed and our mutual friends in the band Mets for letting me use a song from their latest album, Strange Peace. Lost in the Blank City is what you heard at the top of the show. And this was the 416th episode of Creative Control. 416, we talked about Toronto. That's the area code, or one of them. Anyway, 416th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available on all iOS and Android platforms and also on things like Spotify and YouTube and Audio Boom as well. If you can't find an episode that you've heard about, uh, but it's not on any of those platforms, or if you wish to learn more about me and sign up for my regularly scheduled newsletter, please visit vishkana.com. That's V-I-S-H-K-H-A-N-N-A dot com. All of the episodes of this show are there somewhere in some capacity, and I think they're mostly all downloadable if you'd like to do that. So, yeah, vishkana.com. You can like Creative Control on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter at vish creative or follow me at vish kana sometimes i'm trying jokes out on vish creative just because it feels like lower stakes what i don't even know (laughs) i don't know what that means i do some stuff on both and i I, i'm not sure why i have these i used to be a guy named mike who controlled completely controlled the vish creative twitter account and now i can control both of them and so i sometimes i try to sometimes it's me and it's mostly me. It's pretty much all me now, and I'm trying to have fun. Anyway, Vish Creative and Vish Kana on Twitter. You can also listen to a radio show version of Creative Control on Wednesdays at noon Eastern Standard Time around the world at CFRU.ca or on an actual radio at 93.3 FM if you're in or near Guelph. Also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to keep this podcast going. Thanks once again to all of you who do that, and if you'd if you're considering doing it, please do it because it would be helpful for the show if we had even more patrons. So patreon.com slash creative control. Thanks again to Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, and Granddad's Donuts for their in-kind support of the show. Also, my pal Jim Guthrie, he lets me use uh, the instrumental version of his song, The Rest Is Yet to Come, to end this show each week. JimGuthrie.org for more info about him. And finally, thanks to you for listening to the show and telling your friends about it. That's been going on a little bit these days, and I really do appreciate it. Tell your friends about the show and ask them to subscribe to it and download episodes and hopefully review it and rate it positively on their podcast platform of choice. All of that seems to help with the visibility of the show and the spreading of the word and the whatnot. So thank you for that. I have to go. I will talk to you very soon. Bye for now.